Okay, great. So welcome to the group meeting. So this is our first group meeting, right? And uh, <clears throat> first of all, uh, is there any uh, administrative uh, staff that uh, you want to discuss? Okay, if no, then yeah, let's get uh, started. So our group meeting is um, as what uh, I, I, I wrote in the email, right? So uh, in every group meeting, so one of you will present. Okay, and um, and uh, the topic is flexible uh, as long as it is related to your research, right? It doesn't mean it has to be your research. So it could be anything related to your research, right? Okay, and um, so today Xiang will present. Uh, yeah, let's start now. Xiang, you can share your screen. Okay. Okay, so can you guys see? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so today for this one, um, I'm gonna present something like a more like a tutorial about this um code caching private information retrieval and the uh, sort of like a combination of these two, uh, which I have been working on in the uh, past a few years. Um. This is like a very long topic. I have to start with the very basics. And then, uh, uh, I mean, I'll be able to finish this tutorial just today, you know, uh, because we have multiple, we can, um, well, well, today I will have a basic look at this, uh, give you some basic uh, b background knowledge about these topics. And then uh, maybe probably next time, well, it, when, when it was my turn to present, I will give you, uh, talk about more about my research on this. But today I'll just give some brief introduction. So uh, for code and caching, private information retrieval. So these two topics has been probably the most popular, uh, has been very, very popular topics in the uh, research area of information theory. And, but now it's kind of the, the, it's not that popular, but it's still these things are very, you know, kind of very challenging and also very interesting. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. okay. So, Basically, um, there are three parts. The first part I will introduce about the code caching stuff, and then second one is uh, PR stuff, and then I will um, dive into a little bit of what I have did, which is called the uh, uh, cache aided multi user PR, which kind of uh, bring the ca the multi user effect of coded caching to PR. So, which is also very um, a very very interesting problem. I've been thinking about this for. For, for a lot of time, but uh, the problem is still, uh, we have solved some sm uh, specific cases, but the problem in general uh, remains open. Okay, um, let's let, let's start the first part, code caching. So to maybe some of you have heard about code caching. So uh, before we talk about code caching, uh, I want to focus on the, uh, talk a talk little bit about the index coding problem. So um, here's a basic setup for the index coding problem. Um, in this figure here, so there's a transmitter. Uh, let's see, it's a base station uh, in the center. And there's uh, three different users. And the goal of system, of course, is uh, we need the transmitter to transmit something to, 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 to broadcast some, some message to the users so that each user can sort of recover the file they want, OK? So, but the different thing is that if you look at here, so in this system, there's a three files, which is X1, X2, and X3. So you can just think of this as three bits. Okay. So the thing is that each user here uh, actually has uh, has some set information uh, that is stored previous uh, ahead of time. So for example, if you look at user one, so it has stored the, uh, the file X2. And user two has already uh, stored two bits, which is X, X1 and X3, and user three stores X1. And, and in this case, so let's see, user one wants to download X1, and user two wants to download X2, and user three, of course, wants to download X3. So, of course, uh, so the, the, the task of the transmitter is just to uh, send a message to all these users so that they can decode their uh, desired files. And the goal here is we, we want to trans transmit as uh, you know as few bits as possible uh, through this broadcast link. So um, here's uh, this table here. 
just a brief summary of what what each user have uh, has and um and what each user wants so again you can think of this uh, a, a very, very kind of straightforward way to solve this is just to let the uh, transmitter send X1, X2, and X3 to, to broadcast all the things you want, right? So in this case, of course, each user can decode their, their desired files. But the problem is here is that is this is kind of not efficient because this is probably the worst thing you can do, right? You, you just transmit everything. So this requires three bits to, to transmit. But um, a better uh, solution, maybe this, um, if you look here, so in this solution, there's two bits here transmitted by the transmitter. So the first one is a, a, a summation of X1 and X2, and the uh, third, bit, third bit is X3. Of course, with X3, so user three statement is satisfied. But let's look at how user one and user two can decode um, their files from this X1 plus X2. Okay, um, let's look at user one here because it already has X2, okay? So with this transmitted signal by subtracting X2 from uh, from this signal here, so user one can actually decode X1. So um, this is kind of also very kind of similar to user two because user two has X1 there. So by subtracting X1 from this uh, signal coding message sent by the transmitter, user two can decode um, X2 here. So this is of course a better solution because, because it requires only two bits of transmission. Um, okay, so uh, if you have any questions, you can just stop me and uh, ask, yeah. Um, the, the format can be very flexible. Uh, is this clear? Okay, let's uh, just forget about, uh, forget about this thing. Let's just consider another set of set information. Okay, so the information that is stored by each user, we call that a set information, or uh, we call that cache later in coded caching. Let's just consider another case where, um, so like in this case, user one has stored X2 and X3, and user two has stored X1 and X3, and user three has stored X1 and X2. So basically this means that each user has stored all the information besides its desired information. So in this case, we can further improve the uh, transmission. For example, one bit of transmission actually is enough, which is we let the transmitter send just one linear combination, which is one, X1 plus X2 plus X3. Uh, we can see, let's see how, user, how the users can decode. Let's look at user one. And this is all very similar to the previous case because user one has X2 and X3, just by subtracting X2 and X3 from the signal, it gets X1. So th this is symmetric. So both user, the, the other two users can decode their desired bit. So this is only one bit. So this is actually optimal because each user, the, the, the lower bound is like, you have to transmit one, one bit for each user, right? So this actually uh, is optimal there. So this is the, called the index coding problem. So the, the, the feature here is that, so in index coding, so the set information is not designable. It's something that has been given. So based on this information, we want to uh, find a transmission scheme that uh, can satisfy the demands of these users while minimizing the, the, the number of bits uh, transmitted uh, across uh, uh, communication links. Okay. So this problem in general remains open because it's empty hard. It's it's kind of there's some uh, some theories on it, but uh, in general it's open, web and open. And then uh, we see something. If we compare this example and the previous one, we see that if of course intuitively, if each user can store more information ahead of time, so the transmission uh, the number of bits transmitted will be less. So that's a, a, a very intu a very important intuition there. So the the difference now we want to transition to coded caching. The the biggest difference from coded caching and index coding is that in coded caching they assume the cache is designable. So cache by cache I mean exactly the set information. So given the size the amount of information that each user can store, 
So coded caching just has two different phases. It first it de designs uh, the the cache placement phase, which determines the uh, set information uh, of each user. And then there's uh, like the communication phase. And then based on the placement, uh, how can we minimize uh, the 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 number of bits transmitted? Okay. So this is a basic setup of coded caching. So there's a single server and there's multiple users. So this server has uh, uh, access to a set of files denoted by W from W1 to WN. And uh, each user has, uh, has a cache memory. So this cache memory is used to store the set information or some, some bits, which is denoted by Z. Okay, so this uh, problem actually works in two different phases. The first one, as I mentioned, is uh, cache placement phase. So in this phase, um, so the users just fill up their cache memory using the files from the library. So this uh, phase is kind of like the off-peak hours in the internet where the traffic is very cheap or kind of negligible. So you just download these things. So we, we don't know. So the, the number of bits transmitted through this uh, link is just a kind of, we don't care about that. And then comes uh, a delivery phase where, so each user will randomly kind of request one file. It wants to download one file from the server. So when receiving this request, the server should respond, should respond with some bits, just like the index, in the index coding problem. So uh, then that is broadcast to the users. So with, uh, with the help of the cache and the transmitted signal. So each user should be able to decode their desired files. Okay, the metric here is uh, uh, called the worst case rate here. So the rate, a rate for this problem is just defined as for a specific demand. We can see that if the user demands are different, so the, the, the number of bits transmitted can be different. For example, if all the users um, just request only one file, so we just brought that uh, broadcast that file to all the users. So in this case, uh, the number of, number of bits transmitted is not that large. But for if uh, we can think of another case where uh, the, the a lot of different files are requested in the demand. So in this case, you can imagine uh, a lot of more bits has to be transmitted in order to satisfy this demand. So the rate for specific demand is just defined as a uh, x here is a signal uh, from the server. So h here is an entropy. So F here is a file size. So this is just the downloaded total number of downloaded bits normalized by, by the file size. So the worst case rate means that we take the we take the maximum rate uh, among all different demands. Okay. So uh, this is a metric for coded caching. So the task here is just to design the cache placement and the delivery scheme in order to minimize this. Uh, the number of bits downloaded from the servers. So this is a basic setup for coded caching. Okay, so I, actually we can, let's look at some um, very simple examples here. So um, this is a very straightforward example, which is is kind of not optimal, not what coded caching wants to do, but I will get, uh, present this as a baseline here. So in this here, there's uh, there's two only two users okay so there's two files these files are denoted by a and b so what do we do here let's see each user has a memory size that can store one file so by one file i mean let's let's just assume each uh, file here as as shown here each file has two bits for example a has a1 and a2 so the memory size is one as uh, is two bits which means that uh, each user can store store the information that is equivalent to one file. So uh, here, this uh, here is a scheme that okay. So this naive scheme, which is that we just let each user store the first first part of each file. So you can see here. So user one will just store a1, b1, and again this this cache placement is the same for user two. It stores a1, b1 too. So let's see the demand vector is A, B, which means that user uh, one wants file A and user B wants file B. So in this case, because the first part of each file has already been stored there, so the, the server just transmit A2 and B2. So from this signal, user one gets A2, so it has A1 and A2, it gets A. 
and the other B, it already has B1. It also gets B2 from the signal. It, it, it decodes B, right? Let's see um, the, the rate for this uh, scheme is because two bits are downloaded. So normalize the battlefield size, which is two bits. So the rate here is one. Of course, um, uh, uh, yeah, I've already told about, told, uh, said this. So we this can be improved by code caching. Okay, um, this is a code caching scheme for the exactly the same setup as a previous example. But the only difference here, we change the cache of the second user. So in the previous one is A1 and B1. So in this case, we we just uh, change it to A2 and B2. Okay, you can think of this. So now um, for this one, the same demand, um, the transmitted signal is A2 plus B1. Uh, you can, I can pause a little bit and can, you can see how, how these two users can decode their desired files. Okay, so let's see, look at user one. Um, this is a summation, right? Because um, user one has B1. So by subtracting B1 from the signal, a user one get, get, can, can get A2, okay? So it already has A1, A1, A2, now it has A. So this is very similar for, for user two. Because it has A2, it can get B1 from the signal by subtraction. Okay, now it already has B2. So the combination of B1 and B2, user two just decodes what it wants. But the good thing you can see is that we only transmitted one bit through, throughout this uh, communication link. So the rate in this case becomes a uh, one half. This is actually optimal, but uh, uh, you have to prove that, but, uh, but I, I will not talk about this, but uh, this is just, just gives you a hint how code caching works, okay? So we can actually look at another demand, which is, um, for example, now it's the demand is rever reversed. So user one wants B and user Two wants A instead. So in this case, we we we, we transmit A one plus B two. If you look at user one, because A one here is already stored, it can by subtraction it can get B two. It already has B one, so user one can decode file B. So this is uh, uh, the, the the procedure is very similar to like if you have a uh, files both users requesting the file A. We just uh, can transmit A1 plus A2, or both users just request file B. We transmit B1 plus B2. And the rate uh, for the, all these different demands is the same in this case, but in general, it may not be true. So we just take the largest rate uh, among all the demands there, which is defined as a worst case rate for code caching. Okay, so this is a, a general um, rate achieved by code caching. We can see it actually has two K is here's the number of users. Okay, in the in the most straightforward way, we just uh, if uh, we just uh, transmit all the files requested by each user. Okay, that's kind of the the the, the a dumb baseline there. So you can see actually this read here consists of three parts. So the second part, um, remember that M here denotes the uh, cache memory size of each user. N here is the number of files. So this M over N here, just it's just the relative uh, size of the cache memory. It basically means how much information compared to the file library that each user can store. Okay, so this is this part is is less than one. This is called the local caching game. Uh, in a, in a, uh, remember in the first example, naive example I have presented. So we just let the users store the first part of each file. So uh, in that case, because the memory size, uh, you know, this relative memory size is kind of one half. So we it's just to transmit the, the later half of each file to the to the users. Okay, so this is called the local caching game. So you can see this game actually is proportional to the uh, individual memory size m. So this game has been very straightforward, and people has been noticing this for all the time. But the most important thing, new thing in coded caching is this second term. So this second term is called global caching game. As we can see, it's one over this number here, one plus here. So here, let's look at this number here. So here is uh, K times M over N, which this is like the total memory size uh, among all the users. So basically, if all the users, the aggregate memory size is large, basically the second term is very small. We can reduce the rate by, by a lot. So this is one very fundamental 
um, communication saving gain identified by coded caching. Okay, so to summarize, so in coded caching, uh, the most distinctive feature is that um, unlike index coding, the, the cache can be designed. So, okay, so actually coded caching has a very, you know, kind of uh, very, you know, uh, uh, beautiful, you know, this uh, combinatorial design of the cache, uh, which I will not uh, mention here. Uh, if you are interested, you can have a look at the paper, but that's something kind of takes some time to really understand. So by doing that, um, so again, so they create some called uh, multicast opportunities. So what do I mean by multicast opportunities? Uh, we can go back to um, to the index coding here. If you can look at this one here, for example, you can actually view this as a specific coding caching problem, right? Because we uh, I manually set the set information to be this one. So in this one, so if we transmit one linear combination, this linear combination is simultaneously useful to three users. Okay, each user can decode something from this uh, message. So we call this phenomena the 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 multi uh, simultaneously multicast opportunities. Okay, so this means is if we have this multicast, if we can serve multiple users with one bit or one transmission. So this just means that our transmission is very efficient. We can use less number of uh, transmissions to serve the demands of all users. Okay, so this is if we go back to um, coded caching here. So by doing that, so they can actually show the 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 uh, multicast opportunities can be maximized, which is equivalent to seeing that the the transmission rate is minimized. Okay, so this um this load achieved by the first paper of coded caching, uh, it is optimal for uncoded cache placements. So uncoded just means that um the cache placement is is not some linear combination of the files. It's just the uh, for example, one uh, a direct copy of the bits of the files. Okay, so it is optimal if the caching is uncoded. Also, when the number of files is larger than the number of users. So in this case, the worst case would be that all users request all the files in the library. Um, again, um, if you think of another uh, direction, where which is that the number of users is less than the number of files. So in this case. Um, you know, say, because if the number of users are very large, you can see there's a lot of, you know, repetitions in the demand because uh, maybe for file one, uh, three or four, or a lot of more users are requesting the same file. So problems just become a bit messy for this case. There's no general uh, uh, characterization for this case uh, if the uh, placement is uh, coded. But for uncoded, this has uh, this all been solved. So relatively, I can see the coded caching is uh, can is solved in general. Okay. Uh, if you ha have any questions, okay, let's yes. let's go ahead. Uh, yeah, okay. I have oh. a few questions. Okay. Can you go back to like uh, some uh, previous slide? Uh, which one? Uh, can you go back one more. Uh, well, one more maybe. Uh, yeah. yeah. This one. Uh, yes. So okay. now for the for the database, you have A and B, and the user want A and B, the user two want B, and you already start A1 and B1 in the uh, user one local, right? And yeah. in the A2 and B2 in the user two local. Yeah. However, if, uh, I mean, that's uh, you manually said, right? You manually yeah, yeah, said yeah. it. Yeah. What happened if you, you know, start B1 and B2 in the user one and in the, uh, A1 and A2 in the user two, and you want to have the user one to you know to get the A file, and then the user two have the B file. I mean, that's the really opposite way. And uh, I mean, the R will be. that's not a problem. You just change the index of these things, okay? Um, no. Uh, what is that? So once I have fixed this uh, uh this cache here, stored information here, mm -hmm. so this will not change for. This will not be changed for any other demands, okay? Because this the problem is a two phase problem. Once you have decided the placement, you cannot change that. So that placement must be able to let you decode uh, whatever demands the users have, okay? Okay. Yeah. So uh, I guess you are seeing that 
uh, in this case, if we let if, if we change the the, the cache contents, uh, sort of like uh, swap the the, the 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 contents of user one, and user two, and you're wondering if they can still de decode this file, right? A and B, yeah. right? Uh -huh. uh, uh, I guess in this case you have kind of like a, a reverse the signal too. You you probably need to A one and B two there, because no, I mean no, I mean for the user one, the local you have a B one and a B two. And for the user two, you have a uh, E1, oh, and E2. Oh, oh, you mean you mean that? Okay, yeah. that that may not be achievable. You know, if oh, okay. you you if you use that cache uh, cache placement, it not may not be able to achieve this optimal delivery. Okay, um, yeah. So again, you know the what you're seeing is like the index coding problem you call sort of you sort of like you give a random realization of the cash placement and then you look at how you can de uh, deliver the the, the 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 signal to the users right but if you put b1 and b2 in the first user's cache uh, i guess it may not be able to you, you may require for example when it wants one so you have to transmit at least two bits because oh. A1, A2 is not in the cache. You have to transmit all for you when you only, when you are looking at only uh, when you're only looking at user one, right? But yeah. you, uh, if you consider more, uh, also consider user two, maybe you, you need to add one more bit or something. So the the rate is way 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 more large larger than this case, I guess. So so from right now, so what you mean you you have you assume that you can from one bit and decode the whole message. Right now, for example, uh, for the user A, and you assume you you know you already have those kind of local cache, and then for okay. the user B two, you have uh, the A two S and B two in the local cache, and yeah. then you assume that the the X signal can be enough to uh you know to retrieve the the message you want, right? Um, I don't assume that. Okay, so once I have this cache, please. Then how how do you decide I... the X? So I have to design that by looking oh, okay. at this, by looking at this. This, this is like a two-step process. Okay, let's see, it, let's just skip the first placement phase. Let, mm -hmm. let, let's say you decide whatever the cache placement is, like you said, B1 and B2 in the first user. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I have to, uh, by giving this cache placement, I have to design a delivery scheme, decide what X is in order to satisfy the demands of the users, okay? but. In that case, as I as I explained, so the, the, the load can be arbitrarily large, you know, depending on what kind of cache placement you use, right? Mm -hmm. So but my goal, ultimate goal is to 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 minimize the load. So I also have the freedom to design the cache placement. So that's why I'm using this specific placement, not using your B1, B2. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Of course, you can you can write down B1, B2, and de decide what to transmit. You can write that down and see. You can compare the load with this one. Of course, I, I'm pretty sure it, it will be at least higher than this one. Oh yes, okay. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. No problem. Yeah. One comment here. <clears throat> so uh, actually, uh, if we you know cache uh, randomly at uniform that can actually more or less achieve the optimal results, right? I think what you presented, I mean, what you asked is like arbitrary design, right? It's not like every design that can give you the best rate, but if you cache randomly, right? Uniformly at random, then actually we can achieve, uh, in this case, we can achieve rate that is very close to the optimal rate. Okay. That is something, you know, uh, to be careful. Yeah. Okay, with this one, let's go to the second part, which is private information retrieval, which is also another very, very interesting problem in the uh, area of information theory. So in one sentence, the goal of PIR is just to let one user download a specific message from a set of servers okay but each server should not learn what should not be able to learn what the users have downloaded downloaded okay so this is a uh, called a private information retrieval or pr for short so um this figure here is a basic setup for pr so there's a bunch of servers 
uh, from a so the notation here is a bit different. Uh, so n here is the number of servers in the previous case, case for code caching and the number of files. So in this case, we use k to denote the number of files. Um, okay, so there's a bunch of servers and there's one user. Okay, theta here is an index of the files. It's from one randomly selected from one until k. So w theta here just means that this user wants to secretly download that file w theta. Okay, then it will, well, what does it do? It will send a query denoted by q to each of the server. And each, upon receiving these queries, uh, each server just respond with an answer denoted by um, a. Okay, so uh, I put the theta here because of course the query and the answer is a, a function of the user demand, right? So, but the thing, uh, for example, the, the query could be like, could you please send me a linear combination of what all the files and then receiving that, after receiving that query, so each PlayStation just, uh, not each server just, uh, uh, just uh, you know transmit that linear combination to the user okay so uh one assumption here is that so these servers do not talk to each other which means that each server can only say its own query and the answer it can it does not know the the queries to other servers the, this is a key assumption here otherwise if one user knows all the queries there's no randomness at all so because whatever the user knows uh, the server knows so the you, you can indeed hide your uh, this message identity from any server. Okay, so yep. Look at this. Okay, so the goal here is to um, uh, well satisfying this um, privacy constraint. We want to make similar to code caching. We want to minimize the number of downloaded bits from the uh, from the all the servers. Okay. This so D here denotes the uh, total number of downloaded bits. So here H is still the entropy. So this is just summation of uh, the length of the answers from other servers. Okay, so this has to be minimized by the file length. Okay, uh, normalized by the file length. So our goal is to minimize the uh, we call this a cost denoted by R here for this uh, problem. Okay, let's. Um, Again, let's look at the baseline example for the case of only two servers, the simplest case. Okay, in this case, let's assume, um, so here, theta could either be one or two, whatever whatever number, just fix one. Let's see, it's one here. So the query by the user sent to each server here is uh, it's very here straightforward. So H, the query to, um, server one is a vector, okay? So this vector contains k, uh, k binary random variables. So these variables are generated um, independently and randomly from each other. They are either zero or either one, okay? By sending this, um, sending this query, this just means that uh, server one, please give me a linear combination of all the files. So use this vector as a coefficient. As shown here in this, uh, this is the answer from uh, server one. Okay, for server two, it sends another kind of random linear coefficients there. But the only difference from Q1 here in Q2 is that at the position of my uh, desired file, I just plus one there. Okay, so uh, then server two will just transmit A2 to, to the user. So. You, if you multiply these coefficients and all the uh, files, you can see, actually you can get the same thing here uh, when compared to A1, but with an actual file that is desired by the user. Okay, so how do you decode in this case? Okay, you just, the user just sum these two answers together. It will just get the, or subtract, it will just get the desired file, okay? But why is this scheme private? Because let's see, for, user uh, server one, it, uh, what it says is only this vector, right? Query vector. It's just a bunch of random, you know, binary coefficients. It has, it is independent of the desired file of the user. So from server one, this scheme is private. Okay, from server two, although we have have used the H theta plus one there, but server two doesn't know Q1, okay? 
it only says Q2. Q2 from its perspective, it's also a kind of a randomly di distributed, you know, this zeros or ones. So it has no idea what the uh, really what the what theta is. It's either one or two. It has no idea. So this is a very straightforward example here to achieve privacy. Um, let's see what is the cost of this one. So let's say each message contains L bits here. So because we have down to downloaded the two linear combinations, so each is a combination of the other files. So in total, two times L bits has been downloaded from all the from the two servers. So the cost here is two. Okay, this of course, yeah, we can improve on this. The but before um Sun and Jafar's paper, this is a state of the art. But that has been improved by Sam Jaffa in a very important paper there. So before I can talk about the uh, the, the the optimal scheme there, um, we'll need several uh, principles. Um, so these two design the queries to the to the um, to the servers. Okay. So this there are three principles. The first one is called it's called the symmetric symmetry across databases, and the second one is called the message symmetry within the query to each data, to a single database. And the set, uh, third one is exploiting set information um, of undesired message to retrieve new desired message. So I'll explain what does this mean. Okay, let's look at the first principle, which is called uh, database symmetry. So this just means that, let's see if we still, we have two files, okay. So AI is a bit of the file one, okay, uh, file A. So let's see if this just symmetry means that if you request one bit of A here from server one, you have to also request one bit of file A, which is G, which could be a different bit from, from server two. So in this case, the scheme is kind of symmetric uh, across server one and server two, okay? So for, for, for one uh, further example is that if you request one bit of B from server one, you can actually have to request another bit of B from server two, or uh, in a more complex case, you request a, a summation of AI and BI from server one. Then you have to also request a, a, another AG plus BG from server two. So this is called database symmetry. So the message symmetry is just that, let's see if you look at the first row here, if you have requested one bit of A, uh, from server one. So you have to also request a bit of uh, file B also within server one. So within each, within server one, it says you have already requested one bit for each file. So this scheme is kind of, you know, symmetric within each server. Um, for the third principle, I'll explain that in the, uh, in the specific example there, okay? So this is, uh, again, the same setup for that, uh, uh, previous example, two two servers, okay? So two files denoted by A and B here. So uh, we assume that each file, uh, first step, uh, we need to prepare the files. What do we do? We assume that each file has four bits, okay? What we do is that we apply a random permutation of these bits to the file, to the four bits of each file. So this A1, A2, A3, A4 has already been randomly permuted, okay? So, this uh, permutation is not known by any server. So this actually is a key to achieve uh, privacy because you have to uh, have something that a server doesn't know, then you can hide, okay? So the second step is to construct the queries. Okay, in this case, let's assume uh, the user wants to download the file, the file A, so which means theta equals one. So let's look at this uh, procedure step by step. Yeah, at the first step, okay. So DB1 is just server one. The, the in the paper, they call this database. I call it server. It's just the same thing. Okay, so we download one bit from DB1. So, okay. So by the database symmetry, we have to download one bit of A2 from the second server, okay? So again, in this, in the, after this step, we apply the message symmetry. You can see here within server one. So we have downloaded one more bit of B1. And within server two, we have downloaded one more bit of B2, okay? So uh, the third principle, which is means exploit set information to retrieve new desired bits, which means that, uh, remember in this case, the user's goal is to download A1, A2, and A3, uh, and A4, into, right? 
So in this case, here B2 is, is not desired by the user actually, but B2 is downloaded from in server two. What, what the user does is that after downloading this individual bits, it downloads, it downloads one linear combination from the server one, which is a submission of A3 plus B2, okay? B2 has already been appeared in the second server, but A3 is a newly retrieved bit that user the user wants, okay? So this is called explore the set information. In this case, the set information is just B2 from the other server, okay? But we can see that if you, as the user, if you add these two together, you can actually decode A3, right? But from server one's perspective, it does not know B2 is downloaded in the second server. B2 may not be downloaded there, right? Because it does not know the query, uh, what has been downloaded from server two. So again, we can apply this principle to, to the second database where B1 is kind of a set of information. And then we use this set of at server two to retrieve a new bit of A4, okay? In, the, uh, in this procedure, we can see because A1 and A2 has already been directly downloaded from the two servers and A3 can be, you know, kind of decoded by using the combination of two, uh, two bits from the two servers and A4 can be decoded in a similar way. In this case, the user decodes all the bits of A so it can actually uh, recover the file A. So the cost for this one, uh, because in two two you can see six bits are downloaded and each file has four bits. So the cost is just uh, three over two, which is less than two in the previous linear combination uh, of whole file example. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the 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 the, the uh, kind of the this is the optimal uh, scheme there, and then if we if the user wants file B, we'll just do the same thing. First, um, download B1 and B2, and then uh, message symmetry, and then by exploit the set information, which is A2 from server two, and then retrieve a new bit B3, and then also use A1 as set information to retrieve a new bit B4. In this case, B1 until B4 can be downloaded. Okay, so this scheme, so let's see why is it private? So there are two points. Okay, first first one is that the query structure for each database is fixed. It's like this. If you look at the, this is a, for the two different cases of demands. If you look at the, the, the query look at by seeing by each server, it's just a, in this form, okay? So the bar here just means a placeholder. Okay, it can be a random bit there, but we know it's a, a random bit of A, a random bit of B, and a linear combination of two random bits of A and B respectively. This is a structure seen by each server. Okay, uh, the second point is that because we the random bit permutation is not known by the server. So indeed from each server's perspective, it just sees a, bond, a bunch of random you know, binary coefficients there. Okay, it cannot decide what really the user demand is. We can prove this rigorously using the, some probabilities, but that's the uh, intuition there. Okay, any questions? Yeah, just one comment. <clears throat> yeah, maybe you said that already. So, so we have an important assumption here, um, which is that it has to be non-colluding case, which means that uh, yeah, yeah, the, all the base data, all the sorry, all the data bases cannot talk to each other, right? For example, in this case, if base station one and base station two, they can talk to each other or they can share their information. So you can see because the, the key part is that. Although from uh, you know from the view point of each database, so it is symmetric and uh, is kind of random. However, so if we, uh, we 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 can see the the there are some correlation of the answers here, right? So B one yeah. is twice, B two has appeared twice. So this has to be the case, right? So if yeah. the databases can talk to each other, they can figure out something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, of course, you see, if server knows everything, it just, for example, for this one, only A1 and A4 can be decoded. We cannot decode all the bits of B, so it knows it's it's it, the user wants file A, right? Um, but um, I guess that's just another story if you allow subsets of the servers to cloud to see each other's queries. 
again, that would be a harder, it would be a bit harder to uh, maintain privacy. But that's just another problem. Okay. So uh, for the general case, yeah. with can you, can yeah. can you go to the uh, presentation, uh, presentation mode? Oh, yeah. Uh, no. I just forgot that. Okay, for the uh, general case with n messages and uh, with n servers and k messages, okay. So the the optimal download cost is here. It's one plus one over n plus one over n squared until one over n to the k minus one. So this is the optimal uh, information. Uh, in you know information, you can prove that if you using information theory. Okay, this just okay. This is just a a, a short story of PIR. Mm, then let's go to the third part, which is cache aided multi user PR. Okay, so this is kind of my research uh, uh, I'm working on now. So it's kind of bringing coded caching and a PR together. So remember, in coded caching, the phase structure, uh, problem structure is that you have one server and you have multiple users. The task there is to identify how the users can, call, you know, by designing the cache placement. How to you know kind of let the users maximize the uh, uh, multicast opportunities to reduce the redundancy in the delivery to achieve the minimum minimum download. Okay, and in the PR the structure is kind of reversed. You have only one user, but you have multiple servers. Okay, so again the 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 two okay the kind of you know the for these two problems their goals is kind of conflicting with each other because for coded caching. We don't want any redundancy in the delivery. We want to, our only goal is to minimize the download, okay? But for pri private information retrieval, as you can see, in order to confuse each database or server about what the, uh, in order to hide the user demand, you have to add some some redundant bits there. For example, if you want file B, file A, you, you, you put A1 there, but you by this you know kind of message symmetry, you have also put B1 there. But B1 is not the thing that you want. Okay, that's redundancy. But this redundancy is necessary if you want to achieve privacy. Okay, so this is in code cache, we don't want redundancy, but in PR, redundancy is necessary. If we in cache in multi user PR, we we combine these two together. So it's kind of really interesting how these two interplay. Okay. But I have not been able to find in general uh, what the structure, uh, what the problem structure will be like. Yeah. So uh, this is a structure of the uh, MUPR problem. You can see here, there's multiple users. There's also multiple servers. So again, so in this case, so each, um, uh, this problem also works in two phases, like code caching. The first one is a placement phase where the users just, uh, uh, determines uh, place, uh, the cache contents, okay? And then the second one is the private delivery phase, which means that each user will randomly request one file and the servers needs to send a signal to the uh, serv uh, to the users uh, to let them, to make sure they can decode their requested files, okay? The privacy here in this case is kind of a bit more complicated here. So in the one user case, we only have one demand Okay, in this case, we have a demand vector. So KU here is the number of users here. N is the number of servers and K is the number of files, okay? So this privacy requires that each server should learn nothing about the user demand vector. This is a stronger uh, condition on privacy because you, uh, one, you know, one, one relaxed version would be, um, let's see, from each server, it cannot determine what each individual demand is, but it may learn some patterns in the demand vector. But in our problem, we just consider the most uh, the, the the strict um, case. We let this demand vector be randomly distributed over its support. Okay, so we can read this in in terms of the mutual information. So this just means that based on the mutual information, uh, the, the mutual information between this demand vector and the answer. 
seen by each. Uh, so okay, here I use X instead of A here. Okay, seen by each server, their mutual information is zero. So here's some condition here. So the condition on these cached contents is because we have assumed that each server knows what contents has been cached by the users. Okay. So if um, let's see on the on the opposite, let's see servers do not know what the users has been cached. So this is again a totally different problem. The capacity could be very different there. So this is a basic setup for uh, the cache edit multi-user PR problem. So um, yeah, this figure here um, uh, shows. So the black curve here shows uh, the optimal load by coded caching. Okay, the the red curve shows uh, the optimal load by PR. Okay, for two files and two users and two servers. Okay, in this case, this curve is, um, we have one more assumption is that uh, the two users demands are distinct. Okay, uh, we, we actually, when the user demands are not distinct or it's general demands, we actually solved that case in our previous TCOM paper. Uh, but I just use these uh, figures from the latest IST paper, ISIT paper where um, we, for the distinct demands, we can not only we can solve the achievability. We can also solve the converse. But for the general demands, we cannot prove the converse. It's kind of challenging in there, but it's still some ongoing work there. So I just use the distinct demand case there. So we can see for this curve, blue curve, uh, for this red curve, there are two counterpoints. Okay, so the x x here is the memory size, and the y x here is uh, load, or it's just a download cost. Okay just use the different term there. So I'll briefly, the scheme is pretty complex for arbitrary number of servers. Okay, I'll just present a case with two servers and show how we can achieve this first point, okay? So once we have achieved these two points uh, and this zero two and two zero, these are just some trivial cases, okay? So we can actually achieve all the points in the middle by connecting them together using a straight line. This is called some technique called uh, uh, memory sharing, uh, like in the communication. Um, okay, so we, we also we're only bothered about these two kind of points. We we look at this how we can achieve this first point, which is memory equals one third, and the load is equals four thirds. Okay, so again, this is the two server and this is the two user. Let's see, um, uh, let's first de define the structure of this problem. Okay, let's see the two files are A and B and each has three bits. So these files are all being stored by the two servers. Okay, the cache placement is that in this case, a bit complex, it's like A1 plus B1 and A2 plus B2 for user two. Okay, because one bit is is stored. So the memory size is one over file length, which is three bits. So memory size is one third, okay. So the general idea how to design this scheme is that first we can specify an answer structure that is private. Okay, what do I mean by this? Let's look at this uh, inside this figure here. Okay, let's see F1 and F2 are two answers from server one. So this can be two uh, specific realizations uh, uh, of the queries from server one and G1, G2 are two uh, answers from server two, okay? So let's do this. So let's assume by a combination, by downloading a combination of F1 and G1, the user demand vector one, two can be decoded, which means that user one can decode the, uh, can decode the first file A and user two can decode the second file B, okay? Let's see with another combination where F1 is fixed with F1 and G2, the, the, the other user demand the two one can be decoded. Okay, in this case, let's see, uh, we can do this for F2, uh, do the same thing, okay? So because each server has no idea of which, for example, let's look at server one, because it doesn't know which of G1 and G2 is chosen by the second server. So server one actually doesn't know what the user demand, uh, user demand has been decoded by the users. So in this case, we can hide the, the, the demand vector from each server. So because this structure is symmetric, let's see if you fix G1, there's a, a F1 and F2, you can de de decode the two different vectors too. 
Okay, so this is scheme is also private for server two. Now with this structure, uh, what we need to do is that we can somehow guess. So the answers for this each of this F1, F2, G1, G2, it's just some linear combination of the bits of the files, right? What do we need to do? We just need to determine what, what are this, what are those coefficients will be like, okay? So in this case, okay, let's see how we can do done this. Okay, uh, I just gave this uh, linear combinations here. Uh, you can have a look. Uh, I, I'll help you to go through this. So in this case, each answer will contain two linear, two bits. For example, for F1, it contains two bits, uh, bits which is A3, and, and another one is a summation of B1, B2, and B3. Let's see how the, with this uh, 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 answers, how the users can decode their desired files. Okay, let's look at the combination of F1 and G2. Okay, this just means the demand vector is one, two, user one wants A, and user two wants B. Let's first focus on user one, okay? User one, if you look at the cache of user one, so it wants A, so A1 is some desired bit, but B1 is clearly an inference to them. So this has to be download, uh, decoded uh, from the answers, okay? In order to cancel B1 from in the cache. So how can we decode B1? So if you look at the linear combination, second linear combination in F1, and the second linear combination in G1, if you subtract this B1 plus B2 plus B3 uh, by B2 plus B3, you can actually decode B1 directly from F1 and G1. So now user one decodes A1, it still needs A2 and A3. Okay, how, how to get this? Uh, just look at these two uh, in the blue, two bits in the blue box here. A3 is already here. And A2 plus A3 with A3, you can de decode A2 and A3, okay? Now user one decode all the three bits of file A. And this is very similar, decoding process is similar to user two. So A2 is an inference to user two. It has to be decoded from the uh, answers, we can, which can be de decoded from these two linear combinations. And it wants B1 and B3. So because it already has B2, it can, by eliminating B2 from these two linear combinations, B3 can be decoded and B1 plus B3 from which B1 can also be decoded. So this, this just shows that both users can um, recover their desired files. Okay, so here, um, you have any questions about this scheme? This is kind of a bit of, I know it's kind of complex. It's hard to follow why, why you use this, why you use that. Uh, but yeah. Okay. If there's no question, I, I'll just probably sum up this uh, tutorial uh, today. So uh, remember, uh, I talked about the coded caching PR and the uh, multi user PR, which is a combination of these two. I haven't touched any converse. Converse basically means that you have to prove. Uh, I gave a lot of new schemes there. The commerce means you have to prove that, that your scheme is how optimal is your uh, your scheme, how close it is to the uh, you know kind of uh, the limit it can be that it can be achieved. Okay, but maybe in the later uh, group meetings I can I can talk about more about that. Okay, but today's goal is just to give you some background knowledge about this the whole story there from code caching to PR to multi user PR. Yeah. Um, for code caching and PR, the problem is almost solved in general. But for cache edit and multi user PR, the problem is wide and open. We we just solved some specific cases like uh, like two message and uh, two two user case an arbitrary number of servers. We have solved this optimally. But we also have a product design in our TCOM paper, which works for arbitrary number of the parameters. But that scheme is not optimal. It's only optimal uh, within a, a certain gap. It's not optimal in general. So that which means it can be potentially improved. Okay. Again, I want to mention. I uh, maybe I have said this before. Uh, the key challenge here in model user PR is that we want to combine two kind of conflicting conflicting goals of code caching and PR. Which code caching we there's no redundancy in the delivery at all. But PR, we have to add some redundancy in order to achieve privacy. 
but how to you know balance these two in the multi user PL problem is really you know something that is not that trivial to to find out. Um, yeah, and there could be a lot of you know you know prom uh, promising future directions because this is like a new problem there. So basically, of course. Uh, one thing is that unknown cache. You have a, you can assume the cache is not known by the servers. Of course, in this case, it, it, it's intuitively it's a bit easier to achieve privacy because the server doesn't know what you have. Uh, the, the the amount of randomness that the server doesn't know just increases. And also, uh, basically, any variance of the PR problem, like the clothing uh, server case or the symmetry case, where uh, or even a case where uh, instead of protecting the demand from the server, we can add one more layer of privacy, which says that we can provide the uh, demand of the users from each individual user. Okay, this is something, for example, in distributed machine learning, you have to, uh, the, where privacy is an issue there, you cannot let, uh, when you are training like federated average or something, you cannot let each user know what, get some information about what the, 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 the models of other users will have. Okay, so basically, uh, what I want to say is that any variance of PR can be uh, placed into the context of multi-user PR, and the solution there is not trivial at all. So because uh, you have bring this multi-user effect of coded caching to PR, which is uh, kind of the core challenge here for uh, this line of research here. Yeah. Okay, that that's what I have for today. Yeah, that is great. Thank you, Xiao. <laughs> Thank you. So it these are really interesting. Yeah, I, I've been thinking about this problem for years, but you know, it's still still, you know, there's a lot of to think about. Yeah, this is very uh, kind of interesting things. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, that's true. And um and uh, probably uh, some of you may get lost in the third part because it's very complex. So I will upload this on YouTube and you can watch it if you're interested. And uh, in addition, <clears throat> on our YouTube channel, so uh, we have multiple videos on Xiang's research. So if you're interested, you can also take a look. Okay, yeah. I think, great. Um, any Any questions, comments? Uh, I mean, you can, if you are interested at the details of the scheme, you can have a, also check out our paper there, which is uh, a TCOM paper and the latest uh, SIT paper this year. Yeah. Yeah, that may not be, that may not be <laughs> very read, right? So, anyway. okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, if there's no comments, as end for today. So next week would be GIE. Okay. Presenting. Okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good weekend. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.